Hey folks, welcome to this very quick video in which I'm going to be introducing the film that we are covering for this week, uh, which is, as you probably guessed, it, discussing the Alamo and re the Battle of the Alamo, specifically in the Texan Revolution. So, what you need to be able to understand for this is first, we are moving away from the Revolutionary War. We're moving away from John Adams' independence, which focused on the Declaration of Independence, and uh, the Patriot, which was focusing on um, a fictitious version of the Battle of Cowpens, which was a turning point in the southern theater of the Revolutionary War that kind of uh, correlated to the arrival of the French in Yorktown. But we are jumping about 50 years ahead in American history, more specifically uh, involving a new country that's going to be born out of a fight for uh, between Texans and Tejanos uh, against Mex the Mexican government. So what you, need to be able, I'll, I'll, what you need to be able to understand, if I can speak clearly, is that the Texan War for Independence in the 1830s is going to have a direct impact in, in, uh, and directly lead to the Mexican-American War um, in the 1840s. So what do you need to know? First and foremost, we're in the 1830s, 1835, 1836 area. Mexico still owns a majority of Texas, or Tejas as they call it, um, Nevada, Utah, parts of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, California, originally it's called Alta California, and then to, uh, below it was Baja California, which in California it means is, is, a, is a Spanish word. So. Mexico own is a, is a very vast country. It is also a government that in some in some ways is more organized than the United States government. Um, the Mexican government declares independence uh, around or has a war for independence against Spain around 1821. Becomes its own country after uh, being li after liberating itself. Um, fun fact: the Mexican Civil War. Um, it is started. Uh, reportedly by a priest who is uh, ringing a bell at a church near Mexico City. Um, and from there, that involved, they have their own conflict. Mexico becomes its own government. But uh, in the 1830s, it's going to be led by their president, uh, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, who is who likes to fashion himself as if he's Napole the Napoleon of the West. He's uh, very vicious in battle, but also very um, st strategic. So Mexico at the time is in many ways more organized and also more established than some of the uh, state governments and regional governments that the Americans have created around Louisiana and also Texas. So what's going to happen is te uh, this entire northern area of Texas, in particular around this eastern side uh, next to Louisiana, is going to be very, very populated by many, many Native Americans who like to raid and attack the sparsely populated Spanish settlements or Mexican settlements, excuse me, all along the frontier. This entire area is sparsely populated by Europeans. Um, and those that do live around the area live so in mission in Spanish missions that were established by missionaries and also soldiers to either extend Mexican uh, and to some extent Spanish authority into the frontier, um, but also to uh, Christianize the, the natives in a way. So they, they went to spread the Catholic religion. And so these forts, or sorry, these uh, missions, in a way, were very... Uh, meant to colonize Native Americans as well as provide them with the, the, the Mexican religion, Spanish religion. But at the same time, Mexi uh, Mexico is going to realize that, hey, we don't have enough people in Mexico who are either, one, willing to travel to this sparsely populated area and settle and make new towns, or uh, we just don't have enough people in general who are uh, who um, can populate this particular area. Most people are concentrated, concentrated around Mexico City, uh, which was the geographic hub of the Mexican government. And so many folks did not want to come up here to where at any point in time you could be raided by Native American tribes, such as the Comanches and Kiowas. Um, or you just have to deal with the ever-expanding West, the westward expansion of the Americas, or sorry, the United States of America. So the Mexican government is going to decide, look, we'll create a program. We will allow some Americans to come in. They cannot bring slaves with them. Under a treaty, they cannot bring slaves with them, but we'll give them land grants in which they can uh, start to build towns, populate the area, and then. Uh, but they're going to become Mexican citizens in in time. So this is still Mexican territory. It is Mexican country. It is part of the the country of Mexico. I want you to know that because a lot of people don't realize that. So, uh, more Americans are to come in, such as uh, Sam Houston, as well as other folks as well. And they're going to have massive land grants stretching thousands of acres. You want for cattle, two to build, to build towns, to populate the area. However, a lot of them are going to come from the south, and they're going to bring slaves with them, which was directly, a po uh, which was directly prohibited by the Sp by the Mexican government when they prom they allowed 
white Americans to move in. So there's going to be some conflict here. The Mexican government's going to say, look, you cannot bring slaves here. We do not tolerate the use of slavery or the practice of slavery in this country. And you are specifically going against the bounds of the contract in which you sign. The whites were like, no. So what they decided to do is that they thought, okay, the Mexican government is tyrannical, almost in, in a way of like the Boston Massacre, and so, or sorry, Boston Tea Party, and they decide that they're going to actually stage their own revolution. The title for these very wealthy white individuals, white Americans who get thousands of acres and land grants are going to be called empresarios uh, in Spanish. And they are also going to be the leading uh, advocates for Texas annexation into the United States and or Texas or Texan independence. So some myths and misconceptions with the war. Here is the extent of the Republic of Texas that they're fighting for in the revolution. Uh, the majority of battles are only fought in this small region right here, including the Battle of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto, which is going to be uh, shown in the film we watched this week. Texas stretches all up to the um, this part of Colorado, almost into Idaho, and Mexico is established. Uh, its borders are established at these regions. However, the United States is increasingly moving westward. At the same time, many, several of the individuals who move in are very friendly with some of the Congress congressional representatives in, in the United States and say, "Hey, look, uh, you scratch our back, I'll scratch, we'll scratch yours." And you know, if you know. If we start a war with Mexico, will uh, you be willing to support annexing Texas into the United States to become their own state? So there's kind of this like back, these backroom deals are made. And originally, Texas is not part of the United States. And it will not be until the Mexican-American War. Texas is actually going to be its independent country. So if you go to Texas and you ask them about their country, you will have, hear someone who is very patriotic, who says, yes, we are we were our own country. Uh, and to this day, they still sometimes have that mentality. Most land grants are going to be, excuse me, used for grazing, but also still are still prone to Native American raids. And then again, slavery. This is uh, I want to say that this episode in American history, in particular the Texan War for Independence, is almost a direct prelude or foreshadows the Civil War that's going to be fought no more than fifteen years later. So, twenty-five years later, until eighteen sixty. So, the Alamo Mission that you're going to see in the film was originally created by Spanish missionaries and also to some extent some soldiers and uh, Native American tribes around the area who were one Catholic, wanted to spread the religion, but also two wanted to establish some sort of Mexican uh, presence on the frontier and say that, that yes, this is Mexican land, even though there are not a lot of Mexicans who live here. The Alamo is currently uh, a museum in San Antonio, but it doesn't look the same as it does in the film. And there's a website link I want to share with you in our discussion post for this week that, into where you can actually see what it looks like today and what it looked like back then. And also we can compare how it looks in the movie. So Lopez de Santa Ana is a very well-trained, very well-educated elite member of Mexican society. He's also a brilliant uh, tactician and strategist. And so what you're going to see, a lot of people don't realize how, how brilliant he was. So... Characters in the film, you have Sam Houston, who, again, is going to be a former congressman to the House of Representatives from Tennessee. He was also a governor of Tennessee, so he's very well known across the entire country. And, and you'll hear in the film where they, re they mention the fact that he was almost a presidential prospect. Um, he moves to Texas in 1832 and becomes first uh, president of the Republic of Texas after, the, uh, after Texan, Texas wins the war. Um, spoiler alert. And then Sam Houston is going to be directly credited with the 18 minute victory over Santa Ana at San Jacinto, um, in which uh, Houston basically says, look, Santa Ana loves to believe that he's uh, Napoleon. So what is he going to do? He's going to trick him into actually doing his own Waterloo. I'll allow you to see that in the film. You have Davy Crockett, again, uh, who's a very well-known folk hero across the entire American West. He's uh, the man who never misses a shot, the man who wears a raccoon on his hat. Uh, or in his head, and there are new, numerous plays that basically myth, uh, deify him and make him almost a mythological uh, hero in the United States. He opposed Andrew Jackson in Tennessee, which led to his political defeat because Andrew Jackson was very popular throughout the South. Um, and then after he basically is defeated, and is but is still currently a sitting congressional representative, he's going to go to Texas to help out with the Texas Revolution. He's going to say, look, I'm here to help you become your own independent country just as much as what they did in the, the Revolutionary War. So he's going to be um, at at the Alamo during the time of the, the war of uh, Texan independence. But at the, at the end of the movie, you're going to see this scene that it was never real. Davy Crockett is believed to have died at the Alamo um, in the hands of the, the, the Mexican army, but the, the, the scene at the end is not true.
they added that in for effect. So Jim Bowie, you've heard of the Bowie knife. It's named after this individual right here. He was a slave trader, a politician, and originally was born in Kentucky. He's an, another iconic American figure who's going to head into the Alamo and um, he's going to move to Texas in 1830, and he marries a Mexican wife. He leads the Texas Volunteers, and you're going to see him get into conflict with Colonel William Travis, who is the, le the leader of the Regulators. And so the Regulators are like the official Texan army, and then the Volunteers are like militia, who they kind of butt heads from time to time, and you're going to see Bowie butt heads with Travis. He's also going to die from tuberculosis um, later in the film while he's like actually having two guns in his hand, and he's firing at Mexican soldiers. Colonel William Travis is an interesting story. Um, he was originally from a different part of the United States, I believe around Alabama or Mississippi. He has a wife, uh, a pregnant wife and a son around the time of the 1830s, but just becomes kind of disillusioned or dissatisfied with his life and wants to start have a second start in Texas where he sees this as an opportunity to shoot for his own personal glory. So he's going to leave his pregnant wife and son behind, just leave them go to Texas, and then he's eventually going to, he's, he's going to remarry someone else. But in the beginning of the film, you're going to see his his uh, wife, his pregnant wife, come all the way from the state that they're originally from, move all the way to Texas just to get him to sign divorce papers, and they're, they're gonna, he's going to, she's going to leave their son with him. And you'll see that in the film. He's going to become commander of the Alamo because his commanding officer has some sort of, uh, it just says an emergency, but it's really like a medical emergency in real life. Um, so, Travis is going to assume command of the regulators and then try to assume regular command over the Alamo. He's eventually going to assume full control. Um, however, he's going to die defending the Alamo against the Mexican army and has kind of a, a, a large uh, piece of himself is wrapped up in the, the loyalty to the Alamo. Juan Seguin is a very important figure because he is kind of like the Tejano presence. Now, remember, there were different people involved in the Alamo conflict. You had... The Texians, who are white Americans, who wanted, who a lot of them um, favored the idea of Texas becoming a slave state in the United States, um, but also you had Tejanos, who are Native Mexicans, who supported not not so much supported slavery, but put, supported independence from Mexico, even though they were from Mexican themselves. Juan Seguin is going to be uh, in the film. He's going to command Mexican forces at the Alamo. He's also going to be uh, told to go give a message to General Sam Houston to say that from Travis saying that the the, the Alamo has basically fallen to the forces of General Lopez de Santa Ana, and um, you're going to see Juan Seguin actually be very upset with that and not want to leave his men. Then you have, last but certainly not least, the actual general himself, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. He is the president of Mexico. He's highly trained, highly educated, and originally he's going to be defending Mexican interests in Texas. You're going to see a lot of the settlers and various individuals on the Texian side and Tejano side who are very afraid of his well-trained army. They are meticulous, and they're actually in some ways superior to the American army. Um, He's going to win a victory at the Alamo. He's going to kill all the Alamo defenders. And that's where you, in the Battle of San Jacinto, the, the phrase, remember the Alamo, as well as remember the uh, some of the other battles I need to remember. But there's, remember the Alamo and remember uh, the Gordo. But they're going to shout several different phrases to remember different battles where Americans were... Um, or at least the regulators were slain or volunteers were slain by the Mexican army. So he's eventually going to be hated and he's eventually going to be tricked by Sam Houston to follow him straight into the wilderness of Texas to divide his forces, make his army incredibly weak, farther away from the supply lines. And then at the time, at the time when they're most strategically weak, Sam Houston is going to attack in an open field and beat them literally within 18 minutes. And so that is going to be the turning point in the war for Texan independence. And that's what is going to cause Texas to actually win independence from the country of Mexico. So, so with that, here's the historical independence. Make sure you complete the movie guide as well as complete all the other assignments for this module. If you have questions, comments, or want to talk about things, reach out to me at caseanders at perryschools.org. And whatever time of day it is, I hope you are having a beautiful day no matter what's going on.